Bueno, bueno, chicos, we're here. Thank you guys for coming. We're a little behind schedule, so thank you for staying along and watching us. Of course, we have one of the top, well, three of the top content creators in the Bitcoin industry. And I want to ask you guys first a question. By a show of hands, how many of you watch or consume Bitcoin podcasts, documentaries? Oh, wow, so pretty much all of you. Okay. And how many of you have seen these three famous people for their shows? All right, that's a pretty good show, man. All right, now we're going to be it. Most of them, well, we have Marty. He does podcasts, and both of you do podcasts and documentaries, correct? And I want to start with Aubrey. Can you talk about the documentary that you just did in Africa? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me on this on this panel. Um, I'm Aubrey Strobel. I do a lot of content creation in the Bitcoin space, and I made a film last year. It premiered in New York City called Like a Feeling, and it discussed circular economies, uh, specifically one in Mosul Bay, South Africa, where this group uh, was adopting Bitcoin, and um, a lot of the kids there were using Bitcoin for the first time, where they couldn't get bank accounts, they didn't even have ID cards, and they were earning Bitcoin as a form of an allowance, which was really interesting um, because their their town that they live in was riddled with a lot of crime. They needed after school areas to go and they were learning to surf. So the film overall is 13 minutes. It's fairly short if you have time to go check it out. It's called Lack of Feeling. And it's really a, I think it's really a story about hope, to be honest, and self-sovereignty, um, which obviously Bitcoin really just is totally about. But um, yeah, I... It's 13 minutes, and we were able to um, fund a new surf center there for them, and uh, we raised $80,000 in Bitcoin at the time. I think Bitcoin was $20,000, so you know you can do the math on, on the appreciation there. Um, they only needed $15,000 to build a new surf, surf, surf center there, so um, yeah, I'm really proud of the film. That's super awesome. And that reminds me of Julian's documentary that you just covered in Peru with Modem. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the circular economy there? Yeah, I think you showed up in that one too at, at, at one point. No, um, we we crowdfunded a documentary entirely with the Bitcoin community all through like Lightning using Geyser Fund. We went to Peru last December uh, for about a week, traveling to four different really unique towns, some of them in the mountains, some of them in the desert, some of them in the deep Amazon jungle that are all using Bitcoin just as a medium of exchange, not as a store of value. They don't know all the you know the Bitcoin era propaganda. All they want is a functional version of peer-to-peer -peer cash because fiat can't reach places that doesn't that don't have roads. Um, yet all these places still have internet because of all the cell towers that were put up during COVID. So we did a documentary exploring that, all the different types of people using it, what they use it for, they earn it, they buy their goods with it, they see it the same as you know cash, they denominate their services and sats, and yeah, it was a really, really great experience. That's super awesome. And Marty, can you tell us the art of storytelling in a podcast? Because that is super interesting to see, like we have documentaries, but at the same time, most of all the big winners have been orange built through podcasts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think whether we're doing documentaries or podcasts, I think, I mean, podcasts, right, it's this long-form piece of content where you can sit down and have in-depth conversations, really dig into a particular topic, whether it's deep uh, protocol level, technical details of the Bitcoin uh, network, or uh, economic topics and Bitcoin's influence on economic policy, but I think as it comes to like content creation, like that's what I love about what's happened in the space since I got in 2017 is you've had this explosion of different mediums being exploited to get the Bitcoin message out there. So like Aubrey and Julian making documentaries that connects with a certain per person who's looking to learn a certain type of way. Podcasts are another medium where you can learn a certain way. And then Julian and Aubrey as well doing like shorter form content that really picks up people's attention. I think that's Having been in Bitcoin for 11 years, it was lacking in 2013, 2014, when I got into the space, just the explosion of Bitcoin content via different mediums that connects with people who are approaching Bitcoin in a particular way is really exciting and uh, necessary to actually get this message out there because everybody connects with Bitcoin in a different way um, and having the diversity of content mediums is extremely important. 
work. And many of you started content creation as a hobby. When did it transition from a hobby to a business and to your well, day-to-day job? Oh, it's so hard. I feel like with Twitter, I mean, we're all on Twitter, and I think that's where the coin community lives, really, and the culture exists there. Um, so I think really sharing your thoughts online to a public forum every day consistently, it kind of just, you know, accumulates over time. Um, I was originally writing a lot of opinion editorial pieces in uh, publications like Newsweek and CNBC about CBDCs and um, the dangers of them. And then I kind of just, it can take different forms, you know, some people really like to write, some people really are great at podcasting, some people are great behind the scenes. And I think you just kind of figure out what best works for you. And then eventually, um, if people really enjoy what you're doing and believe in it, you can often get funding for the things that you want to do and um, luckily now even Twitter is, or X is paying content creators for, for participating in the conversation so uh, yeah there's a lot of different avenues to sort of creating a business for yourself. Julie? I think for me it was I think most of the great ideas and inventions in the world come from people trying to solve their own problems. And for me, when I got into Bitcoin in 2016, it was really hard to find credible voices that would break down certain concepts. Like, you know, why, you know, why is deflation not this big boogeyman we should be afraid of? And all these things that you you, you can find the answers to, but you have to go deep into books and have to go wealth of knowledge that I think really can be explained in, in shorter time frames and by using pop cultural references and. That's the way that I always learn. I've always loved watching video essays on YouTube. I spend way too much time on TikTok. Um, and surprisingly, and I'm seeing more of it these days, um, but you know, back when I started, there was almost no one making content like that. And so for me, I wanted to make that content. So to be honest, I wouldn't have to have like 20 minute or half an hour conversations with my friends and family or tell them to go read a book. I wanted to make stuff that I knew they would also want to watch and be a part of just because it's entertaining and fun to be a part of. Morning. So when the podcast newsletter became like a business, it's an, honestly, if we're being honest, an advertising stand were willing to pay me to uh, advertise alongside our content. And for anybody who's out there thinking about making Bitcoin content, I would just warn you, the revenue is very cyclical and very uh, attached to the Bitcoin price. Um, but beyond that, like beyond TFTC, Rabbit Hole Recap, the newsletter, and I'm a managing partner at 1031 as well. And it's really interesting to see how content is, it's how you market yourself these days. So if you're starting a company, whether it be a pure media company to distribute content about Bitcoin or a venture capital firm, like content is key. Like you need to be out there producing content, getting it out there. So uh, it became a business for TFTC, Rabbit Hole Recap, when advertisers came. Then at 1031, Rabbit Hole Recap, specifically is like a part of our strategy like you have to if you're going to be a bit a business a venture capital firm specifically for us you have to be producing content getting your name out there getting your ideas out there so it's multifaceted like it can turn into a business itself from the media perspective or if you're doing another business i believe it's imperative particularly in the digital age the world that we live in that you're producing content as well so that you can basically show the world that you know what you're talking about. And for us at 1031, uh, showing investors and founders that uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, we know what business is defined, we know what we're talking about. It's funny you mentioned like sponsors, and because all of you are, um, you have huge followings on social media. Do you guys in a way feel censored with all the amount of people that you have watching you or because you signed with a specific sponsor, you feel like you can't really share what you actually think? Um, I mean, I'll just answer this super honestly. Um, my, I had a podcast, um, and it's still going, actually, every lunch day called The Observation, sponsored by Cash App, and Cash App definitely, it's a publicly traded company, a uh, blog is, that owns Cash App, and so there are topics um, that sometimes they don't want to cover, and they'll be like, you can run it, but you just can't have the sponsorship on this podcast. So it's, you know, do you want to take these risks with your audience? Because a lot of the companies don't. Bitcoin can be controversial. There's things, there's people who come into this space. You saw two candidates talk about Bitcoin for the first time, presidential candidates, um, Robert F. Kennedy and former President Trump. And 
sometimes brands don't want to associate with that, even though there's politicians coming in, even though the Bitcoin is nonpartisan and it has become political. So when the conversation shifts and it's dicey, it is hard to have free speech when you have a sponsor. So you have to ask yourself, is the sponsorship worth it or do I want to go on my own? And currently I have no sponsors and I don't want any sponsors. Um, and I and I love Cash App and I would continue to work with them. It's nothing, nothing bad there, but I'm just being so honest because I'm not sponsored right now. Like if you do pick a sponsor, just make sure that you align with them because you can be censored by your sponsor. Yeah, I think when it comes to sponsors, like I know Bitcoiners say, you know, don't buy other assets, you know, don't throw out the diversified portfolio thing. But I think as a creator, you definitely need to get a diversified portfolio of revenue just because usually the default ends up being, oh, I'm going to rely on this sponsor revenue because most of us are not, you know, Mr. Beast getting 30 million views and we can just live off ad revenue. We need sponsors generally to fund these large travel documentaries or to have a crew that has a traveling podcast. And so there's a lot of trade-offs. Yeah, there are certain topics and areas you can't cover for political reasons or you know, you're worried that, you know, they're worried that might alienate, you know, a portion of their customer base. And that's why I always say, like, if you can, just be really close with the community that you're building because if they see value in what you're doing and you're providing value, and you can explain, you know, this is how this stuff gets funded and you're open and transparent, they will come through and do it. We crowdfunded with 130 other Bitcoiners. And in fact, the coolest thing about creating content in the Bitcoin space is, in general, let's just say you have a million followers and you ask your followers to buy a Patreon or subscription. From what I've seen, the carry-through rate on that is about one in a thousand. So if you're a mainstream creator in comedy, you know, travel, whatever, you can maybe convince one in a thousand of your viewers to contribute to any given project their hard earned money. In Bitcoin, from my personal experience, in the crowdfunding that we did, I had one in 78 of the followers that I have contribute to this project, contribute to multiple projects, and that's because Bitcoiners really care about advancing that message and pioneering Bitcoin to more and more people. So I would say if you're getting into Bitcoin content creation, stay really connected to the people that care about you and follow you, listen to them, meet them at conferences, because they're gonna be a part of this community and, and what we're all doing in Bitcoin for a long time to come. And they're more than happy to support a really good project that pushes what we do forward. Hey, uh, at TFTC, we touched a pretty uh, third rail topics that we have for the last seven years, and so, uh, we're very particular. So we're very particular with our sponsors for two reasons. Number one, we want to make sure that anybody who's listening, if we have an advertisement alongside our content, that it's a product that we would actually use and recommend to our friends and family. And so, trying to align with value align sponsors is number one. And number two, just having an open conversation with them, like, hey, I'm going to talk about Jeffrey Epstein. I'm going to talk about climate change. I'm going to do all this, and just prepping them, like. I don't self-censor uh, because of sponsors, but it's also having conversation with them up front. Like, hey, we touch pretty third rail topics. Like, I'm on TFTC, our YouTube channel is on a list that the Center for Countering Digital Hate put out. Uh, That's an accomplishment. Yes, for being uh, new wave climate deniers. Um, but yeah, it's just being open and honest with our sponsors. And luckily we have sponsors that like the open conversations that we're having on our shows. Uh, and, and get what we're doing and, and back us and support us. And I'm very happy for the sponsors, Unchained, River, uh, ZapRite, Crowd Health, a bunch of others that are supporting us, CoinKite. And uh, to Julian's point too though, that's the beauty of Bitcoin and what we're seeing, particularly the podcast world, the podcasting 2.0, where if there was ever a reason down the line, I don't think there will be, but if there ever was, we are able to monetize directly from our audience via podcast, via the Lightning Network, and podcast for 2.0. So when we send the podcast out, we put a Lightning Network public address in our RSS feed. And now with apps like Fountain, Breeze, and other podcast players with Bitcoin wallets that are coming to market, we have that fail safe where if our listeners like the content, they want to make sure they're able to sustain the business that we're running, they can directly contribute. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's being upfront with your sponsors. If you're going to bring them on, like, hey, we touch these third rails, we're going to talk about this. Um, and then on top of that, making sure the sponsors are people that you would want your audience to actually do business with. So of course, we're going to start wrapping up. But the final question is, I asked obviously 
the Twitter followers, because this is a content creation panel, what is one thing that they wanted to ask you guys? And one of the questions that popped up was, how do you orange build your family and friends, and have you guys already orange built your parents and friends and family? Um, I used to give people the Bitcoin standard, but now I feel like it's just like rude to throw a book at someone and be like, read this, and I never do. Like it just, I gave it to like my entire family one Christmas. I don't know if anyone's touched it or if it's just like laying dormant in their houses or whatever. I think video. I really do think video content um, is the best form. Um, so I have like a, a list, I have a document where I send them like some of my favorite links to different clips. I think they stick, I think my family understands now. They still think I work for Bitcoin. My mom, I, I think, thinks I just still work for Bitcoin. But um, I think it is sticking though. I think if you just like keep a document, keep a Google Doc of like great references. If you see a great podcast that explains something super simply, send it to your aunt, send it to your uncle. Because the next bull market, you know, you're going to get those text messages rolling in and it's just nice to have it all organized. Yeah, I think the way that I look at it is like people's attention is finite. So there's, I don't know, 7 billion people or 6 billion people that go on the internet at the same time. I think the average screen time of a human being on Earth now is like an hour and a half to two hours a day. So you're constantly fighting over people's attention and time. And so when you put content out into the world, the way that I do it is I think, okay, you know, I have a mission. My mission is to orange little people. Some people's mission is to make them laugh. I have to still compete with them no matter what they're trying to do. So I have to make the very best content that I can that also happens to Orange Fill. So sometimes Orange Filling comes second to the true mission of just getting in front of someone as quickly or as imaginatively or as creatively as possible. And I think if more Bitcoiners took that approach, we would probably have more mass appeal. I think it's really valuable that we have these in-depth conversations in the books, but it's like a sales funnel. They're, they're kind of like the second part of that funnel. We need more people designing the top part of the funnel that's like the hook that grabs and competes with other forms of content to get them interested in going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in the first place. Yeah, completely agree with that. Like I said earlier, like everybody approaches Bitcoin in a different way, so it's trying to fine tune the content that you feed somebody uh, based on their worldview and how you th what you think they would be most receptive to. Uh, and I think another important point is like they have to be receptive. Like uh, long past are the days when I would be that that family member at uh, Thanksgiving where it's like you guys got to buy Bitcoin. It's like that's not worth it. When somebody's willing to listen, that's when it's like, all right, here's what I think you should do. You should go watch Julian or Aubrey's documentaries. Maybe watch these short clips on TikTok. Uh, maybe you're more of an academic economics nerd. You're just graduating and suddenly with the Bitcoin standard. But yeah, I mean, when I was that aggressive orange pilling zealot back in the day, it took my wife, I think, five or six years to get on the Bitcoin train because I had her crying at brunch because I told her that the financial system was melting down. And that's not the best approach. You want to make sure they're receptive, number one, and then think of the individual that you're trying to orange pill and what they would connect with most and feed that content to them. All right, and our time is up, but before we leave, can we all take a selfie with the audience? <laughs> this is a content creation panel. You have to. <laughs> yeah, I hope you guys don't mind. If you don't want to be part of the selfie, you can leave. Ready, everybody? Smile! Offset on three. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you, guys.